Folks, hello, another episode of Let's Talk at uh, John. We talked in the previous segment about the mindset and uh, planning to design, acquire, and deploy technology in higher education. Now I would like us to switch a little bit to a parallel topic, which is, is it, if it weren't for the leadership of technology, academia would not have changed, and student success would have been stuck in where it was in the 1960s and the 1800s and wherever. And what I mean by that is, were it not for the internet, we wouldn't have had online courses. Were it not for uh, uh, the internet, we wouldn't have had the uh, learning management uh, software. If it weren't for your uh, Zoom and Teams and, and uh, I'm forgetting names now. Anyway, folks, uh, uh, we wouldn't have had HyFlex if we didn't have uh, all of those high quality microphones and cameras and whatnot, none of the high flex would be meaningful and impactful on students. So how do you see the, the leadership of tech in disrupting education for the better to enhance student success? Boy, yeah, that's a important big topic. So you're welcome for this. Hot potato. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, as you alluded to, right, th things, I mean, have really advanced, especially in the last few years at a, at a fast pace. And I think we feel that the abilities and flexibilities, so a lot of the advancements that are coming along, right, are a lot of times providing flexibility in, um, you know, the amount of resources that you have to access, you know, how you can access just education in general, right, online recordings in person from what devices you connect to from where um where the instructors are right so just all, all of that flexibility as opposed to being a fixed a fixed process um and then the support materials that you have access to there's just there's just a lot more flexibility and choice and i think it's it's interesting that i feel like it's outpacing in many cases it's outpacing our ability to to incorporate them across the institution, um, you know, because it's, they, they, the, the new solutions and the changes are happening faster a lot of times than the humans that are providing them can, can adjust to them. So, um, there's a lot of cool stuff, right. That's coming, but the, the challenge then becomes not only if you can find the money to buy it and implement it because it, it can make a difference. It's the, you know, getting the institution to, to pivot and be able to adopt, to adopt those, to provide them. Um, so, and as you, as you alluded to, so let's say video capture, which isn't necessarily a new topic, but just the, the cost and quality of, of delivering that, I mean, not only allows, you know, students of whatever flavor, um, as far as traditional, non-traditional to, to get access to to the recordings, you know, whether they miss class or whether they want to go back and focus on certain topics that they didn't necessarily quite understand the first time to help them be more successful. But then it also even allows one in some environments to pivot how they're offering the class and do flipped classes, right, where now the traditional sage on the stage lecture scheme changes and you do that, you do that aspect outside of the classroom and then you get to focus more on hands-on lab learning exercises, collaborative, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but I would argue in a lot of, in a lot of cases, right, the tools then become available, but our ability to maximize the usage of them across the org then then becomes a an adoption challenge so right it's 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 fun stuff we have a lot of new tools that were essentially being added to our toolkit that we can make a difference with but even once you get that tool which can be difficult to accomplish as we talked about in the past segment um just because you then get it as a tool that's on the wall doesn't magically make the the outcomes uh better right but it it it's a disruption that has been invariably positive for the learner and enhancing their success enhancing their access right 100% so when i'm thinking about uh something as as trivial as automatic uh, uh closed captioning or ai mm -hmm. uh the you know the the that is 
fastly evolving that allows you to capture what is being said. That increases access for the individuals who are hard of hearing, the individuals yep. who are, uh, you know, who, who've got an attention deficit and what have you. So, so academia is further enhanced because of things that have nothing to do with that academia. Perhaps not even the adoption by academia is uh, is what's at stake here. Do you agree with that? And, and how do you look at those? So, things? so tell me a little bit more about what you what you're thinking. Excellent. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I was in a course that was a uh, collaborative with a couple of other states, and I and uh, the lecture would re be recorded uh, on a VHS tape, grainy quality. Mm -hmm. They'd make multiple copies, mail it to the various institutions. I had to go to the library when it was received, sit in a corner, put headphones that were worn by so many other people, and it had to be during the hours that that library was open, and if the uh, VCR TV that was this big was available or not broken and listen to it. So it was delayed. Mm -hmm. It was lousy quality. Uh, and as you remember, the cassette would wear out sure. pretty darn quickly. Right. So that was well over 25 years ago. Sure. That was technology at the time. Right. And that was disruptive technology, but compare it to today. Right. For example. right. right. Right, but so, but I think, so if, I, if I'm following what you're pick, or picking up, what you're laying down there is just all of those access barriers, right, have just been shattered. So, I mean, now we're, you, you know, in most cases, again, it's going to vary on what your, what your program is, but just the ability to access any content anywhere, anytime, any device um and and even change right that if, even if you're in town a this week and you have to go on the road or you travel that you can still continue to access the education so all, all of those access barriers are are shattered and um it, and then you just you kick it up a notch then with having these additional layers of tools whether it's ai ish you know, analytics tools that the student themselves let's say interact with to get automated summaries uh, of classes or what's coming down the road in the form of, you know, personalized, essentially personalized tutors um, that can help them. But then also similar analytics engines behind the scenes that can um, help us ultimately, ideally achieve higher student success by giving us um, early warnings on how students are doing and how, how engaged students are um, based upon whether it's in class indicators or out of class indicators, right? So a couple of high level buckets there, just all of the access, uh, barriers just being, being shattered. The challenge is then maybe being, okay, how do you get folks onto the bus that then they actually have access to, to all those tools. But then once, once they are, um, in the environment, we have access to a lot more sensory type of data to know how folks are doing. Then the challenge becomes, okay, what do we do with that? And how do we, or what do we do to engage and, um, you know, get more involved with the student to try and then bend the, the, um, the, the chances of that student being successful, being retained, completed, competent in their area, et cetera. So, so with that in mind, John, how do we, what do you think could be done? Not how we, uh, what do you think we could, uh, could be done to get academicians, to get instructors, to get faculty, to adopt technologies when they're comfortable with a particular way of doing things? I'm comfortable in teaching face-to-face. -face. That's the only way I'm going to do it. You're not going to force me to use the LMS. I am going to teach online. But it's going to be totally asynchronous. I'm going to just put my presentation and I'm going to force them to read it and I'm going to have quizzes and that's it. Okay. Sure. How different is it? It's not that different, but what's the right. secret sauce that you right. found? Well, so, yeah. So first of all, I don't, I don't necessarily think that there's going to be a single secret sauce, right? You might have to have a, a, a whole cabinet full of, of sauces dependent upon the kind of cross section of, of your faculty. But I think with a lot of them, it's going to, to help with 
trying to get buy-in that there is and recognition that there is some problem or some opportunity opportunity for improvement so that then they can connect with the why right to understand oh okay well and agree with that maybe there is something to be said for doing things differently right and if we just start with the you have to do it this way which maybe at some point you get to that point but if you more start from the perspective so that they can help buy into the idea of, you know, painting, let's say painting the picture with personal stories of, of, you know, how the current methods of delivering whatever services are leaving some folks behind, or it's not, they're not, we're not maximizing, you know, graduation rates or success rates in certain programs, help, help them buy in and understand that, Hey, yeah, they get them to agree that there's something that needs to change or that we can do better and ideally, if you can even then know know the person you're interacting with to know what their motivators are, um, then you can try and speak to that. And then it just becomes a question of, okay, well, then how do we accomplish that? And then it's whatever, you know, new product or tool or workflow, et cetera. But it's, but you don't, ideally, I think you wouldn't probably try and start with that. Um, you would start more on the why side and getting them to to buy into um, the value of trying to do something different. But again, I mean, we, we both know, I mean, that's, you're not going to, even with your best of intentions and as polished of change management processes, uh, you know, that you're not going to get everybody on board, but you, you do the best you can. And then, right. and, and a lot of times another strategy that folks will do is to find, find your champions, which honestly, there's, there's trains of thought on who you pick as your champions, both being those that are, are, you know, forward leaning and open to change, um, that can help show that something could be successful. But there's also trains of thought where you also pick some of those, um, individuals that may be most resistant and work with them on a very private and personal basis to try and, you know, get their buy-in as we were talking about, because sometimes, you know, if folks see that you can even convince those that you think would have been the most resistant and least likely to do something, boy, I mean, does the ice thaw for the rest of the folks, um, thinking that, well, Hey, we're not going to, we're not going to drag our feet more than that person, you know, we right. was going to. So. And we, we have, we have, we have them. I'm pretty sure the listeners are, can think of numerous people at their institution. And, and so, so they're out there. And if you can get crack that, not your, your way ahead than uh, the average person on the curve. Uh, so this was another episode, uh, talking with John about the uh, tech and colleges and and this one was about the leadership of technology in shaping academia and enhancing student success. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, you can find us multiple times a week, every other week uh, on Let's Talk Ed. Uh, you can find us uh, wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. We thank you for joining us. We'll catch you next time.